Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all our friends and colleagues who are joining all over the world today. This is John Froelich and I want to welcome you to our latest webinar, our second this month and our second actually in two days. This one is focusing on S4HANA, primarily focused on S4HANA and accounting and finance innovations, how moving to S4 can greatly enhance your accounting landscape. Today, we're going to primarily focus on and talk a lot about some new concepts around uh, fit to standard, fit to purpose, and a, an area we call fit to purpose or fit to standard equals fit to innovation. Uh, joining me today is Julio de la Costa. Uh, so, welcome, Julio, for day two, Carrie Peterson, and Birgit Starman. So, Birgit, thank you for uh, joining us again. Carrie? Uh, so we'll go through the agenda. Again, we're going to talk a little bit about S4HANA and finance transformation. I want to share with all of you a concept that we have been sharing around ASUG and AT and AT and T. Goodness, SAP around the idea of what is fit to standard and what does that mean and why is it also your platform for fit to innovation. We'll talk a bit about predictive analysis and simulation, go through some process optimization, and we'll see a few uh, demos here. So I think you're in for a real treat today. Next slide. Um, just a reminder, by the way, everybody, this is being recorded so that you know that, um, and then we'll dive into this. Uh, so we are recording this session, so be aware of that. Uh, you can download it, share it with your colleagues. Uh, and then you can obviously ask a whole bunch of questions uh, throughout the uh, session. So uh, go ahead and do that. So let's talk a little bit about how digital technology is transforming business. And really it's about uh, the finance organization or the organization of the future. And as you see here in the middle of the chart, we're talking about transforming finance organizations, but it's really about transforming your entire organization. And all of these various elements are really conspiring or adding up to influence how your business goes to market uh, and how you develop the new, what we'll call, SAP calls the intelligent enterprise, we call it the digital uh, business. Uh, so let's just start at the top left-hand corner and we'll go around and talk a little bit about it. Uh, and we'll ask a couple of, you know, from Birgit or a couple other folks, maybe a couple of comments on this. Um, you know, we'll talk about cloud. Uh, everybody is turning to the cloud. The more that we all are out here with customers like yourselves, the more we hear people saying cloud first. Um, and, you know, it's it's why cloud? It's about fast deployment. It's about reaping the benefits of cloud, lower costs, and we'll talk a little bit about that. About big data. You know, what do we mean when we talk about big data? Um, big data is, in the old days, we talked about uh, megabytes and gigabytes. Now we're talking about terabytes, petabytes. Uh, and even more than that. And the challenge that companies have today is how do I get real-time insights with in-memory computing? And how do I drive not just record to report or looking backwards, but really take that information and improve my business and look forward? And if you think of big data, and Malcolm Gladwell has a great quote that he gave during a recent presentation we saw. Um, in the past, big data was about a puzzle. How do I get more pieces of the data? It was always back in the day. Um, how do you get more information? How do I build the puzzle? I don't have enough information. With big data, internet of things, uh, all of this activity, it's no longer about the puzzle, it's about a mystery. You have all the clues. Think about the game Clue, right? Or the movie Clue or any of these other mysteries. It's You have more data than you can use. And the challenge that we are presented with and organizations are presented with today is how do I sort through and make sense of that data? And we'll talk a little bit about how the latest tools from SAP do that. We'll talk about how a fit to standard approach helps you with that. User experience. Um, yeah, I'll let you know when we change here. Uh, user experience, um, you know, as I watch my, my son and everybody else, um, my son last night was filling out his uh, job application to Costco last night using his telephone, his phone. It's all about the user experience. How do I make things easier? How do I make them more intuitive? Uh, robotics and machine learning, we'll spend some more time talking about that. Uh, predictive and cognitive, we'll talk some more about that. Uh, we hear a lot about blockchain. 
Uh, but it's not just about blockchain itself. Blockchain is simply one way of doing uh, a distributed architecture or distributed ledger uh, process. Um, but what is going to happen in, in the future of that? And of course, business networks. Not everybody, you know, not everything is all in one place. How do I connect with the networks? An example of that, of course, is treasury, where you have a core treasury system, but around the outside you have uh, input from various uh, places. So you know, your banking, your Reuters, your trading platforms, et cetera. So SAP and, and, and the world is focused on this digital network. Next slide. So let's talk about, and maybe Julio, you can comment for a second on this whole concept of, of the changing role, but the expanding role of the CFO. You know, we hear from the Digitalist magazine, the Office of Finance needs to reconcile its function, et cetera, et cetera. It's really about, I think, Julio, and you can you can yes. comment on this and Birgit, moving away from looking at the past and being the, the, the guy in the office who says, well, here's the numbers and here's what happened yesterday to here's what happened yesterday, but here's what it means for the future and predicting. What, what are you seeing in that space, Julio? Uh, yes, John, thank you very much. And thank you for having me today as well. So from the expanding role of the CFO, what we really see is CFOs and finance organizations, they're really looking for more analysis. And why is that important? That's important because not just CFOs, but executive boards, they want more information to make decisions quicker, faster, and with better information. So what does that mean? That means that we in finance, we in accounting, we in finance, we in treasury, we really need to have better information at our fingertips. So therefore we can give the executives in our organizations all the data they need to make better decisions as far as historical decisions and better decisions for the future. Uh, Birgit, do you have anything you want to add to that as far as the CFO organization, what you're seeing from? Oh, thanks, Julio. And uh, I agree that it's not just about what happened yesterday. Uh, a part of that is knowing why it happened and being able to analyze that, but then taking that on a predictive path into really looking at what could happen in the future. And I always like to use a merger and acquisition example. What if I'm a company that is looking to acquire somebody else? Who would I acquire or should I build my own product? And looking at the financial implications of each of these decisions. And that's a lot of prediction. That's a lot of simulation. That's really forward looking. So if a company doesn't close its books until 10 days into a period, then you're halfway through the next period and you really don't have the real time information to make a decision. So it's really about looking forward, understanding why something happened, and then extrapolating that into what could happen in the future, what is the most likely thing to happen to make better business decisions for the entire organization. So Birgit, as far as the comment we see here from Unilever, one of the things that really struck me was, besides the acceleration, and we're talking about the in-memory database of HANA, what, what was struck me was the comment about the user experience improve significantly. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure, I think in a lot of cases uh, previously, if somebody in finance wanted a new report that added a field or took a couple of fields away, they would typically need to go through IT, create a report variant, learn how to use it. But right now with that new user experience that John mentioned earlier, basically finance users and managers and even executives can basically determine on their own what they want to see. They can add their own fields. They can configure a KPI that's that's put out there, whether it's operating margin or something related specifically to GRIR. So they can configure their own parameters without needing IT because it's a very consumer grade experience. So they don't really have to go and figure out um, yeah, exactly how do I do it, ask IT, have a long turnaround time. So there's none of that. So basically, um, having that user experience doesn't mean you have to go to a week-long SAP training anymore to figure out how to use the software and the analytics. Excellent. John? Okay. Next slide, Carrie. All right. So, you know, here we'd like to talk about keeping the lights on and lights out, we'll call it lights out finance. But really, the idea here is, you know, Allowing the CFO and the organization to focus on what really makes a difference. 
Uh, in the past, as you can see from this graphic, CFOs, controllers, treasurers, the business in general, has had to spend a lot of time really focused on the day-to-day -day activities of paying bills, collecting money, and doing all of that. And for us, it's really about how do you move to the next level? How do you begin to allow people to drive business innovation? A lot of that comes from what we've talked about around predictive analytics, improving the user experience, and then creating an IT environment in which you have a integrated platform that brings together all of your sources of information and lets you ask all the right questions based on this concept of a single source of the truth. So that at the end of the day, you're really focused on the activities that drive innovation, the activities that present you and give you an opportunity to be uh, more competitive, to give you competitive advantage in the marketplace. Next slide. So what are some of the driving forces for finance tri transformation? Uh, number one is the adoption of industry-wide standard practices. Uh, a lot of companies that we meet with, and I know Birgit was just at an event last week around uh, SAP Insider and S4HANA, uh, we hear companies coming back to all of us talking a lot about, you know, SAP, Bramasol, you guys know what we have to do. Help us adopt practices that make sense for our business. Help us get away from the constant need to create customized solutions. The need to predict business performance ahead of time. Um, you know, it's great that you can see what your, your cash position was 24 hours ago or 10 hours ago, but what's your cash position today? How do you take advantage of that? How do you optimize the op your benefits and ROI from the cash you have? And how do you make sure that you're getting the maximum uh, advantage of that. How do I predict my cash flows or how do I predict um, what I will need in terms of manufacturing um, inventory? All of that is about prediction. The next is the drive to continuous close. Uh, and it continuous close is really that concept or the idea of how do I turn from you know 15 to 20 days close to always being aware of what my close position is. How do I know at the end of the day what my books look like? Where am I uh, in terms of inventory, working capital management, all the things that need to move you forward? Um, responding to new regulations. Uh, as we've seen, and we'll, we'll talk about, and maybe Julio, you can comment on yep. this too, is mm -hmm. we see a proliferation and constant change, Julio, in the space of new regulation, yep. whether it's you know, IFRS 15, 16, 17, 9, the new regulations that are coming out for CECL or everything else. Talk a little bit about that from your perspective. Yeah, sure, John. So I think this is very important because, you know, being an accountant myself, working in corporate, in corporate environments, what you find is the FASB and the IASB has been very active in the last six years. You know, the major topic has been revenue recognition, ASC 606, IFRS 15. Then a year later, it has been leasing. Now it's going to be ASC 815, which is hedging and derivative accounting. And they've been very active. And when you implement any software, especially ERP environment, what's important is you can't have those changes in the environment change a company's decision-making process. That is why when you talk about uh, add-on tools such as CLM for leasing and RAR for RevRec, where it automatically integrates into the SAP landscape, it makes that process, the adoption process, that much easier. Because as opposed to, and we've seen, John, companies spending tens of millions of dollars on these adoption, the accounting adoption, uh, projects and they have to actually take a breather or pause because they're too tired from doing these adoption projects. Whereas when you go into an integrated system such as you know as for HANA, where it's already built in and you know you have the reporting for these new adoption standards, it makes it that much easier. And again, the main visibility that CFOs and executive boards are looking for is faster access to make decisions quicker and right. more accurate data. And if you have this integrated platform, as opposed to having a software where you have to download the information, 
analyze it where it's all in one, it makes that process that much faster. John, back to you. Yeah, and you know, Julio, maybe you know, you and I and the rest of the team talked uh, recently about some of the challenges as we went through our exercise around business canvases. And one of the places that this really applies uh, is the audit committee, right? Mm -hmm. We all think of regulations as, oh God, I've got to go do regulation. But at the end of the day, the audit committee as part of the board of directors um, and the board is responsible for the accuracy and timing of all of the reporting. And, and maybe you, you just a quick comment on, on your thoughts on that too. Yeah, so, you know, from, you know, especially for public companies, John, and private companies as well, you know, within the board, there's the audit committee and really the audit committee, as we've seen in the last five years, they are really held responsible for the adoption of these new accounting guidelines. So they have to understand how is the company addressing these accounting changes? Is it a software solution? Is it a manual solution? And really having the, 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 the functionality of a tool like contract and lease management or RER within the SAP landscape is critical. And it actually makes the adoption that much easier and more efficient. Sure, and Birgit, maybe you can comment for a second. I, I know, you know, we talk about the regulations in terms of the finance regulations, but I'm sure, you know, having having spent some time with uh, one of your colleagues, Lane, last week, and a number of others, maybe you can comment about it, your your thoughts and SAP's thoughts on the regulations around things like GDPR and data privacy and uh, Dodd Frank, et cetera, and 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 why that's also driving finance organizations. Sure. And before we leave the finance topic, one thing I'd also like to say is that response to new regulations also means, in, for public comp companies at least, um, an automated response, XBRL filings, for example. So some of that, hopefully companies are beginning to automate, not just doing those things manually. Um, but when it comes to GDPR and data privacy, I would say in a lot of cases, it's not really an optional thing anymore. It's almost like Sarbanes-Oxley years ago, but GDPR has gone into effect and it's been in effect for over a year in Europe. And we're not seeing the last of GDPR. There's a similar type of regulation that's going into effect in January, 2020 in California. So basically giving everyone the right to know how their data is being used, how it's distributed, where it's being stored and the right to actually delete it. And uh, at least for GDPR, there's a 72 hour period that if there is a breach, uh, everybody needs to be informed, whether it's other companies or whether it's actually consumers. And they have the right to have their information deleted. So it's not just a nice to have anymore. That is really regulation that, that many companies need to actually abide by. And the interesting thing is the first time I did a presentation on GDPR, I asked how many people had heard of it. Three hands went up. There are about 100 people in the room. And one of them said, well, we're trying to figure out how to get around it. Well, there is no getting around it. it it's here to stay. Sure. Makes sense. OK, Carrie, next slide. So let's, let's uh, uh, take a different track here for a moment. And let's talk about, so we've talked a little bit about what's changing in the finance world. Let's talk about an approach to S4HANA that we believe is the right approach uh, and will help businesses. So let's talk about this, this idea of fit to purpose versus fit to standard. And let's, let's kind of define that. So in a fit to purpose environment, you're focusing on customization and fitting the solution to the company's unique processes. It's really taking it and saying, here's how company A works, let's adopt the software to this. In a new environment, what we're saying is, no, we're going to focus on the best practices. Why not the best practices? So it's sort of a reverse approach and it's a change of mind. In a fit to purpose environment, what you see is a lot of deep discovery on existing processes. Um, you know, having done this for over 23 years, Bramasol has seen many, many different discovery processes. They can take days to weeks to months to document all of this. The idea of fit to standard is to give you an early view of the software and how it works. To walk through, for example, your AR processes, your AP processes, your inventory processes, um, some of your uh, basic manufacturing or warehousing processes that are very similar and saying, 
how can you or how does this work for you? It's a very different way of looking at it and it focuses on the idea of rapid deployment and it, it also enables an approach that allows change management early. Next. The approach is from a different perspective, right? It's not how am I different from everybody else, right? That, that's what we thought of when we did a traditional R3, S4 approach. It was how am I different? How do I how do I change the software? This is, my approach is how do I take advantage of best practices for common processes and then focus in on your true differentiators? Every business does certain things uniquely. There is no doubt to that. Um, just because you take a fit to standard approach doesn't mean that 20 to 25 percent of your business, 15 percent of your business isn't unique. It's, it, it's what makes you special. But in taking a fit to standard approach, what you do is say, okay, we all pay bills the same way, we all check our bank accounts the same way, but it's these unique processes on how we do, for example, maybe available to promise, or how we manage our cash, or how do we do global liquidity in a working capital management scenario that makes them different. Um, Birgit, any thoughts on that? Definitely. And I think it's interesting, back in my consulting days, um, everybody thought that they were 80%. I think right now what I'm seeing is that companies are realizing that they have certain uh, really competitive advantages with some processes, and they're focusing more on that competitive advantage, whereas there are a lot of basic finance processes that really don't give you a competitive advantage. I mean, I used to joke, oh, how many ways can you clear an open item? So a right. lot of these companies are really now focusing on, well, what's my competitive advantage? Let me concentrate on those processes, which is what makes them unique and not some of those things that are pretty much generic across the board. Absolutely, that's great. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> so we're gonna run a little bit rapidly through these so we can get to some of the innovation areas, but let's talk about some of the trends. I, I recently presented this in a couple of different places. Um, and the trends that are really driving the adoption of fit to standard are focused on four basic areas. One is just a plain old desire for more standardized processes, leveraging best practices. Uh, the need to lower costs, the benefits of cloud, and the technology trends. Next slide. Why push the standard processes? Because you can reduce errors. When you have standard processes, people get used to and get a com and, and, and are able to work in that system. It reduces the amount of error, it reduces the amount of thought that goes into it. It's pretty straightforward. It improves efficiency. Believe it or not, it improves flexibility. When you use standard processes, you can be more flexible on how you use your team, how you use your staff, how do you leverage all of that. Um, auditability, certainly a standard process, uh, improves your ability to audit. Um, it, you know, when you look at what SAP has done, and certainly SAP has been uh, reviewing all of their processes with the big four and other audit firms, you know that by using a standard process, your audit time, your audit costs, and the quality of that audit are, are lower. Easier comparison across units. What do I mean by this? If you use standard processes across your organization, it, it makes it easier to compare how you're using working capital across your different organizations. You can compare the profitability across the different organizations much easier. Uh, so by using those, it gives you an easier way to maximize your leverage, maximize that comparison. Security and risk. All right, well, how does standard processes help with security and risk? Uh, number one is by using standard processes, you have built into that workflows, you have built into that standard roles using governance, risk, and uh, compliance areas, and you are able to manage that. Also, because companies like SAP have built in different security around standard practices or best practices, um, They've also leveraged that from a security perspective, the availability to get into the key, key data fields. You understand better who should have access to what data. And finally, the idea of workforce flexibility. Again, if you use standard processes, uh, you, you have more flexibility in who you can move around the organization. Next. 
the constant pressure to reduce costs. It's easier to manage and maintain if you don't have uh, 100 different Z, Z tables and Z codes and Z options and Z this and Z that. It's much easier to maintain and manage. You can do upgrades faster. I can't tell you the number of companies that we talk to on a regular basis who haven't done upgrades for four, five, six, seven years because it's just so difficult to look at those customized um, fields and areas. Faster integration, you know, um, Birgit mentioned this early on. The industry is seeing a phenomenal, the, the world is seeing a phenomenal amount of integration of different units, uh, merger and acquisition, spin-offs. When you use standardized practice and reduce costs, it's easier and faster to integrate those units, easier to upgrade your software, and of course, quick training of new staff and, and quick, faster time to value. Um, Julio, any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, so John, what, what we see is every company is trying to reduce cost. And, you know, using standardized processes, whether it be financial processes or any business process, is going to lead to some efficiencies. And those efficiencies will help drive those costs down. So I think, you know, obviously when you do, I'm a big fan of the 50 standard process because when you have that environment of a process that has been vetted, that has been reviewed, that has been uh, signed off on, and to your point earlier about having reduced audit costs, it actually drives costs lower. And it, it really does, because as opposed to having every process different at every company, if you use, as we call the best practice for that environment, for AR or AP, or, or record to report or your closing process, then obviously when your auditors come in or you have a review of your process, if it's a standardized adoption that they've used, it's going to be less hours, less audit cost. And that's a very important factor for a lot of companies in today's dynamic environment. Absolutely, yep. Next slide. Um, We'll talk about the drive to cloud. We hear it everywhere. Um, by using standardized practices, let's be frank, um, that's what the cloud is all about. Standardized practices, standardized approach, a core set of software with limited customizations, extensibility around the outside. And this allows for security, scalability, flexibility, cost management, and the ease of overall maintenance. Um, people move to the cloud for a number of different reasons. Uh, clearly, one of them is the ease of overall maintenance. How do I allow and push off the upgrade and introduction of new features? How do I get the latest and greatest? By using standardized approaches and standardized software and processes, you can get the information, you can get the new features from SAP or any of the other companies that much easier. The other thing is the trend, and I call this to outsource, um, it's really the trend towards something as a service. Whether it is software as a service, platform as a service, or infrastructure as a service, more and more companies are moving towards pushing this out for a number of different reasons. Um, again, it's, it's about security and scalability, about flexibility. Companies want somebody else to manage the security. Companies like AWS or Azure or Google or other platforms that really understand security or whether it's SAP from a hosting perspective uh, in their multi-tenant cloud approach, for example, where they're managing the security. They have hundreds of people who are experts in security helping manage that process. Scalability, it allows you to scale um, as a growing organization as you acquire or scale down as you divest. Um, even scaling and flexibility from the perspective of you know, it, during the close period, you might need more users in a particular area than, than not. So Birgit, you know, you've been spending a lot of time out there with a number of customers. Any thoughts on this from your perspective? Definitely, and this really goes back to um, companies are more willing now to do that outsourcing because they're outsourcing processes that, that, that is not necessarily their competitive advantage. That goes back to the point that I was making earlier. And it's interesting to me that now more and more finance and risk are at the forefront of adopting the move to cloud. And it's not so much the manufacturing because everyone feels that their manufacturing is a bit more unique as opposed to finance and risk processes where 
maybe some of the revenue recognition or the way that treasury is being handled. That might be very unique, but some of the core processes are not. So finance is actually more at the forefront of adopting these new technologies than they ever have been before. And the cloud facilitates that. Yeah, thank you. Gary, next slide. Let's talk a little bit about new technology. We're going to dive into this uh, in a bit more detail, but the data explosion, I talked earlier about the data explosion. Why move to standardized processes? With all of that data out there, a lot of the reasons why people created customized reports or customized transactions was there were the databases could not handle or the standard setup could not handle um, the kinds of data that you want. Today, there's an, a, a proliferation of data. And if you, you know, we talk about O data and X data, right? Operational data and experiential data. Just the explosion in operational data and the amount of data that you can use in a real-time tool, a database, for example, like uh, SAP HANA, opens up the amount of uh, data that's available to you. But how do you standardize the processes so that that data is consistent across all of the different areas and that you are looking at consistent views and information? AI, machine learning and RPA, and Julio and Birgit are gonna talk a bit more about that. But AI, machine learning and RPA function best, in my opinion, and I think, you know, as I've read, and, and you'll hear more, really function best on standardized processes. Uh, and as SAP continues to build more and more tools around this, it's easier to take advantage of these tools using the standard standardized processes. Why? Because the standardized processes, number one, make it easier and faster for the tools to use that, but they also reduce what I'll call bias. Um, when you have a customized process in your organization, you tend to introduce bias into the equation. You create a customized view because it's your unique view of something or your unique process, and that can introduce a bias in the data into that process. And that bias then will translate into artificial intelligence, machine learning, and RPA tools and may not drive the way you're hoping to, right? The idea of machine learning and, and AI is to open up new thought processes, to open up new avenues, to look at analytics from a place that you didn't before. And by introducing bias into the equation, you're moving in a direction uh, that, that, that might be the wrong way. You're, you're sort of, it's steering the car you know, you don't like highways, so you you avoid the highways all the time, but maybe the highway is the best and fastest way of getting from point A to point B. The last point around new technology is Internet of Things. The more we see Internet of Things, the more we, and, and Internet of Things, I think we all think of the traditional uh, machines talking to machines. Um, but think of the Internet of Things also as payments, uh, so for example, Amazon in one of its newest stores no longer has checkout counters. Um, in Costco, for example, they have long lines, they've introduced self-checkout. What Amazon has done is taken that to the next level and put RFID into all of the products. You load them into the cart, you walk out the door, the machine, there, there's a machine at the door that automatically scans and knows what you've put in your cart and has all of your information and now charges you. Think of that as, well, how do I manage my payments process in that? And again, the internet of things is so invasive across so many different areas. Um, Birgit, any thoughts on that before we move on? That's actually one of my favorite examples, John. Uh, just, based, just remember to take something out of your cart if you didn't want it after all. But it definitely is, is more automated and I would say just because it's automated, it does also reduce the errors like you and Julio were mentioning earlier, because a lot of times just because it's manual doesn't mean that it's more accurate. So by having these automated processes in, in place, it definitely streamlines it. And that goes back to the customer experience. So the X or experiential part, part of the experience. Um, and that's something where we wanna see how that relates to finance and risk as well. So what are the financial implications? Well, it's certainly quicker payments, customers happier, they don't have to stand in line, et cetera. So I think it really does have a financial impact because hopefully that means more customer loyalty going forward, which means more revenue for a company. Absolutely, sure.
Next slide. Gary? We're going to fly through and uh, uh, give some time over. So that's great. No, the next is great. You know, we're going to, we, we talk about leveraging the SP activate invitation approach. The traditional is, you know, how do I take your order? It's that can, that other approach. Um, SAP Act is all about best practices, methodology, configuration tools. It supports faster and uh, more inline methodologies and approaches to that. Next slide. Why do we use this? Um, SAP Bramasol leverages the SAP Activate approach, and Activate was built on the con these six concepts. One is, or three concepts. Number one is, how do I shorten the time to value and reduce costs? The second is reduce risks while moving forward. When you take this big bang approach, you introduce a lot of risk into the equation. The idea of Activate is a hybrid. Um, agile approach that allows you to take an incremental approach, reduce the risk, and manage that process. And again, it also introduces the idea of flexibility. So being able to not just work in the on-prem environment, but really whether it's in an on, an in, in the totally in the cloud, a hybrid environment on-prem, or how do you use your mobile devices? Next. So the idea is to accelerate the delivery of your outcomes by starting with best practices, bringing those all together through a rapid deployment solution or what we know as SAP model company is another example of that and, and look for more on that in future webcasts. You pre-assemble it in the cloud uh, or you pre-assemble it, whether it's the multi-tenant cloud or single tenant cloud, you're pre-assembling those, you're going through an iterative process. And while you're going through that iterative process, even with the assembly of the best practices, you're constantly managing the change process and, and engaging in change management. And finally, by using the agile business approach, you are allowing yourselves to do things that much faster. So at the end of the day, you get customer value, efficiency, and speed uh, out of all of that. Julio, did you want to comment? Uh, no, John, I think, uh, you know, when you have, when you start with best practices, it really, uh, accelerates your deployment, your project, because they're pre-built, they're standard. So therefore, when you get to that point, you really see the value of having that standard process, and you're and you're actually using a best practice methodology from SAP's library of best practices throughout different company environments, different industries. You're getting the best of the best in that inst instance. I really like this model, John. Yeah. Next slide. So based on 40 years of SAP implementation experience and, of course, 23 plus years of Bramasol, here's, the, here's our suggestions. And then we'll move. Uh, I'll turn it over to Julio and Birgit. Start with your best practices. Really use a, a fit to standard approach. Validate your solutions. Really look at it not just from a fit gap, don't focus on fit gap as in what's the fit gap, quote unquote, to the software, but it's really how do you enable and how do I enable our teams? How do we help them understand where we're going and help them uh, understand how things change? For example, moving from uh, SAP GUI or NetWeaver to the Fiori tiles and, and helping people accelerate that and validate that process. You become modular, scalar, and agile. Um, I think that's we've said enough about that. You're cloud ready uh, and all of these other uh, aspects to that. And of course, with that, you get quality built into that. So, you know, SAP has done a lot around uh, identifying and, and managing the quality of that process, just as Bramasol has uh, as well. So with that, um, next slide, I think we'll turn it over to Julio. Yes, sir. And uh, take much, it away. John. Thank you very much, John. So. John just spent a considerable amount of time really explaining the S4 methodology, why using best practices. So, but what's the real business value? So there's tons of value propositions, but you know, obviously I'm an accountant, Brahma Sol does technical accounting implementations. So the accounting innovations is really critical. Next slide. And I just wanted to start this by saying, I really love this slide. 
and I think you can understand why, because this is an, this is an SAP provided slide and it says, accounting at the heart of every enterprise. So Birgit, I don't know, maybe you can take us through the slide because I, I really like how it's laid out and shows the value in every stage of the process of what it offers from an accounting finance perspective. Sure thing, Julio. So I'm gonna actually start from the bottom up here because I think the record to report, that's something that's never gonna go away. John mentioned in an earlier slide, it's whole that part of keeping the lights on in finance, but not using all of your resources to keep the lights on, but using your resources to provide more value. If we look at the bottom of this slide, the record to report, this is really the process that we use for our financial accounting. So basically the whole idea of recording, every time we have a logistics process that takes place, we automatically get that financial record, whether it's a goods issue, whether it's an invoice that's coming in from a vendor, an invoice that's going out to a customer, we always automatically get those transactions. And we record these in, in what we now refer to as a universal journal. So that's basically your financial accounting and looking at those accounting processes, there are always going to be some manual processes. For example, if accruals need to be made, some of those can't necessarily be automated. Um, and then we get to the point of the financial close where we will need to run some processes. Now, luckily with the power of s hana Finance, we don't need those overnight processes anymore. So that's the whole idea of a continuous close or a soft close, that at any point in time during the period, you're actually able to see what would the financial statements look like if I were to close today? And that includes both the legal entity reporting, so that's basically your company code, and then also your, your group consolidations. So basically looking at the close from a corporate level. And then from there we move to financial reporting, whether it's reporting internally or to your stakeholders with those financial results, um, basically your financial statements, your balance sheet, your income statement, et cetera and also disclosing externally, especially for public companies. So things like creating your annual report or doing those quarterly and annual XBRL filings that are really regulatory um, things that have to be done. So that'll never gonna, that's never gonna go away. If we look at the top here, the plan to optimize, this is really more your management accounting because a lot of decisions need to be made within a company that don't just rely on, well, here's my tri trial balance in my balance sheet. Uh, a lot of times that is summarized at a higher level. So in order to look at the planning, look at some predictions, being able to provide more value from a finance organization perspective, we really need to look at those predictions, what if analysis, um, using some of those tools to see what a desired outcome is to make decisions. This is really more your management accounting. And here we're starting to look at different business drivers. Business units might be at a lower level than your general ledger. Business units might be at a lower level, including profit centers, cost centers, projects, et cetera. And being able to look at various profitability dimensions. So here we go into the management accounting piece. Profitability dimensions can be, what does this look like by customer group, by individual customer, by product group, by individual product, by geography, by, by sales channel and making those decisions at a lower level than quote unquote, just the GL account. So when we get to the close process, even though we're also generating financial statements, we're also doing a margin analysis. And luckily with s hana we're able to do that without having to move data into a data warehouse. We can basically use the same table that we use for transactions to do some of that reporting. And with HANA, we're able to calculate KPIs on the fly. That KPI might be an operating margin. You can break that operating margin down by, again, geography, channel, customer product, in any order that a user might want to see. And being able to look at those margins and see where there might be potential issues. And then reporting and steering, that go, takes that information and takes that prediction even a level further than planning to really model different business scenarios in the system and then using machine learning, which powers our predictive engine, to see what the most effective recommendation would be for a business decision. So that really allows us to draw as finance and risk organizations advise the entire business on the best course of action and look at the financial implications of each decision. Thank you. Uh, Next slide, please. So the Universal Journal is really the, the innovation that SAP has developed 
to come up with all these uh, accounting innovations. I don't know, Birgit, maybe you can speak very briefly on the concept of universal journal and how that is actually transforming and giving the ability to use all these simulations, predictive accounting, and all that good stuff. Sure. So the universal journal is basically one table that contains all of your information. So if you think about previously in SAP ECC, um, you had various different tables. You had financial table, BSEG, you had various different tables in CO, one for cost centers, one for profit centers, one for orders, one for projects. Um, the list kind of goes on and on. And because that was all built on a relational database, not in memory like HANA, um, basically we had index tables and totals tables. So the whole idea is that all of the information is within the universal journal. And that includes all financial information, your entire coding block, your GL information, as well as operational information such as customer, vendor, product number, asset number, et cetera. So all of those different subledgers within finance are stored in the universal journal, as well as all of your controlling information, cost centers, profit centers, material ledger, profitability analysis. So basically everything is in one place. So we no longer have to wait to move things into a data warehouse. We no longer have to do reconciliations between line item tables and totals tables before we can move on and start to reconcile and start to do what if analysis. Everything's in one place and drives both transactions as well as analytics as well as prediction. And that's a huge innovation because that also eliminates a lot of the overnight runs that have to happen. Um, for example, an example we're going to look at later in this webcast, uh, GRIR. Thank you very much. Next slide. So when we talk about predictive accounting, we talk about SAP Leonardo, there's really two different uh, methodologies. The first one is top down, which is prediction using algorithms, historic data. But the, the one that SAP is referring to predictive accounting is actually using what's already in the system. It's actually using your sales orders that you can see in the system. So when you have a, a sale, even though you don't do the accounting, you don't record the revenue, the sales journal is in the system already. And basically this is what the predictive accounting bottoms up prediction is actually doing. It's actually looking at what's in the system and what would happen if we did the revenue recognition today as opposed to at the end of the month or the next two months or what have you. So it's not really like looking at an algorithm and predicting out, it's actually looking at what's already in your system and doing that predictive accounting, and predictive good issue as you see on the screen and predictive invoice. And Birgit, do you wanna add something from the bottoms up predictive accounting methodology that SAP is doing? Yes, definitely, because I think there's also the whole aspect of different periods. So the sales order might be in period one, but then based on the payment terms of a customer, um, you might have a net 30 payment term, you might have a net 60 payment term, you might have a net 45. So the predictive aspect also takes a look at, well, this is what's expected or committed from the sales order, knowing that the sales order may change, but I would say in a lot of cases it does not, but then also taking a look at what those payment terms are and being able to predict, oh, okay, well, we're going to have this much revenue in period two versus period three based on some of the payment terms. So there's that whole aspect of the timeline that's associated with it as well. Thank you. Okay, you want to go two slides down, please? Yeah, one more. So from the predictive analysis and simulation, you know, just, some, just, to, just to bring it all together, it's all about looking at the future. How does it impact today? How does it impact tomorrow? It's basically taking all the data you already have in your system and bringing it to today to make you make those decisions quicker. There's also different types of simulations, as Brigitte was saying, what if scenarios. And the nice thing about it is that you can extrapolate p &L for the next five years and look at multiple different scenarios. As Brigitte alluded to before, if you're doing an M&A analysis or you're trying to understand whether you should buy a company or make a product, this is a tool that you're going to use to really help you look at your data in different scenarios. It's going to help you decide faster with more reliable information on what are some of the critical uh, decision-making processes that you have to do in the next five years or 10-year forecast or you know, capital planning. 
So it's very important, and I think that is a tool that a lot of companies are excited about doing. So, Birgit, from your perspective, what, what are you seeing when you present these topics to your customers and SAP customers? How do they respond to this sort of methodology of predictive accounting and simulation? I think, especially in that event that John mentioned, I attended last week for the Insider in Charlotte. Um, I would say that there's a lot of fascination with this. I would say it was about half and half. Some customers had didn't, had not heard that this actually existed. So I've actually had a lot of follow-up emails from customers asking for additional information. And SAP has pre-built several um, applications that already leverage this being able to predict, uh, for example, financial statements out, um, some of that predictive accounting that Julio, you were just talking about. Um, so those customers who didn't know that existed are fascinated by it. The others are starting to think about, well, what is my current landscape and how can I move to it? And do I have to, yeah, can I move for example, in a hybrid approach, can I use some cloud tools now to get to it now versus having to do an entire upgrade? I mean, the short answer to that is yes, you can. Uh, but so a lot of, for a lot of customers, it's not when, but it's not if, it's when is the right way to say that. Correct. Uh, Carrie, next slide. So now, because we're running out a little bit around all the time, let's talk about what we like to talk about, which is machine learning. So we just spoke about predictive accounting and all the benefits and values of it, but let's talk a little bit about machine learning. And you know, there's three stages that you see on the screen there. The first one is what we talked about, what, what, what we as accountants have been doing for the last 100 years, which is manual processing. The next stage is really getting into using the machine learning tool to help you make better decisions, doing your transactional data for you. And the next one is really automated processing. So Bridget, why don't you talk a little bit about, from your perspective, from the SAP perspective, the machine learning from phase one to phase three, if you can. I think the this is another one where there's a lot of interest from customers, because again, this is really initially targeting a lot of processes that are not really anybody's competitive advantage. So SAP, again, was on the forefront in the finance area. Um, we actually created an application called Cash Application. It's kind of funny to call it the Cash App app, but that's what it is. And it's really about um, doing that matching on receivables processes. So I would say the system can be trained. We need at least 5,000 records so that the system can learn, the machine learning engine can learn um, how exceptions were handled in the past. Now, of course, the more data that you have, um, the better the learning is going to happen. And then the idea is that once your normal processes run, when you run it through the machine learning engine, it has already learned how exceptions were handled in the past. So maybe instead of 20 screens of exceptions, now maybe you only have two, which makes finance teams more efficient because they have fewer exceptions that they need to go through to handle that. And there's an option that companies can use to basically say, well, the machine learning engine, if it's a certain percentage confident, whether that's 70% or 95%, can actually make those postings automatically, which again increases the automation and efficiency and reduces the number of errors. And I think as a side note, it's actually the machine learning, learning engine that powers our predictive uh, processes as well. So that's just something important to know. So as we go into specifically machine learning for the GRIR tool, you know, it's a simple, you know, every, every accountant has had their fair share of goods receipt, invoice receipt, the, the application, you have to match it at the end of the month. But with this machine learning tool, it automatically matches it for you and learns as you go along. I know we're running short on time, Birgit, but you want to give a quick overview of the actual GRIR tool? Sure. And this is another example um, of, of a process where uh, the machine learning engine is trained and it basically learns and then it looks at different processes that a company may have in place, whether it's two-way matching or three-way matching. And I think it's important to realize that, that um, it will handle either one. So it'll go through, does the goods receipt equal the invoice receipt? Yes, it does. Automatic clearing. Um, that's kind of a standard process anyway. But if it does not match then basically it takes a look at to see what was automatically cleared in the past, looks at current open items in GRIR, and then 
normally what would happen is there is a manual investigation, which might mean phone calls, might mean a lot of time, decisions on whether or not to write off an amount or whether to go ahead and clear it if it's in a certain tolerance level. So basically what that used to involve is a lot of manual work. What we're saying here is that with the new GRIR application, based on what happened in the past, it already knows and can make a recommendation. And what we're seeing a lot of customers do is when they start implementing these processes, first they wanna see what the recommendation is going to be. And then in most proof of concept projects, usually after about two or three months, they're pretty comfortable and they'll go ahead and just let it post and then they'll just deal with any remaining exceptions. So Birgit, we can't, we, we can't have a AI machine learning webinar without talking a little bit about the cash application, which is at this moment, SAP signature machine learning application. So I be, instead of me speaking about it, maybe you can just give the audience some of the really cool features of this application. <laughs> Definitely. So this again is the first application that we have that this application in all of SAP. So again, we're seeing that finance is actually at the forefront here. And so again, it looks at the history of payments and invoices. It looks at bank information that comes in. Um, it looks how different customers might have paid in the past. Does a customer historically use basically one payment to cover multiple invoices? What does that look like? Are there any currency discrepancies? Um, all, the, all those kinds of things that needed to be manually processed previously. So we can do that automatically. And the great news is that when we initially released this, we did not have lockbox. And yes, we have lockbox now, which is a very important message for North America. And we can also handle the payment remittance advice. So basically, if something comes in by PDF or email or via a scan, um, it's basically smart enough to take a look at that document and look at the payment remittance advice and use that to make decisions. So again, nobody has to go look at that extra document manually. We can basically use the machine learning engine to do that, which is a great way of combining both structured and unstructured information. Thank you so much, Birgit. I mean, I think next time we have to have a webinar on just the GRIR, John. <laughs> yeah. Well, so yeah, and, and one of the things I'll encourage people to do is we'll be having a bunch of a, 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 a set of demos that are up on our website very shortly. And you can see some of all of these different, whether it's the GRIR Cash App or some of the other great um, innovations here. So some key takeaways as we wrap up here. Number one, specific solutions for you and your organization um, to to Focus on your core objectives. Remember, it's all about begin with the end in mind. Um, think about what your goals and objectives are. Take a lesson from Stephen Covey and begin with the end in mind. Focus on what differentiates you uh, from a financial accounting expertise. You know, are you focusing in on, you know, how do I turn compliance into competitive advantage using tools like um, finance accounting, RevRec, and the RAR solution in lease management? We talk about industry knowledge. Bramasol has a huge um, expertise in, in e-commerce and, and in high-tech industries, but focus in on what makes you unique. Use the standard processes and tools to, make, to, to allow you to focus. Think about in-depth business transformation experience. A lot of companies we find are using S4HANA and they're doing a technical migration. Our suggestion is, don't do that. Take advantage of the fact that of all of the innovation and all of the tremendous opportunity that uh, provides you. We talk from a Bramasol perspective about the concept of comply slash standardize, optimize and transform. If your goal is really over time to transform your business, take advantage of all that S4HANA has and build that standardized platform to comply, but also to standardize and build your frameworks. Next. Think about your finance transformation with a cloud-first strategy. At the end of the day, we'll all be moving into the cloud. The question is how, when, and why. So think about seamless integration with third-party solutions. Real-time analytics. The real change here in what's, what S4 and, and SAP are bringing to the table is around analytics. Whether it's the digital boardroom or the pre-built views that are created or the value add services that companies like Bramasol add around the outside for revenue accounting, lease accounting, and treasury, it's all about the analytics. It's all about getting predictive insights and analytics around that. 
Office of the CFO and Center of Excellence with Acknowledged Experts really go for a partner who understands the office of the CFO, understands your order to cash processes, procure to pay, record to report, plan to optimize, all of those different areas. And finally, transition expertise utilizing, utilizing methodologies developed from the past. You know, we can help you with understanding change management. A lot of this will be about how do you move from point A to point B? How do you help your employees understand you know, what's the job they're going to be doing in the future and how does S4 HANA enable that? Next slide. So I wanna take a moment to thank Birgit and Kerry and uh, the team here, Julio, uh, for this great uh, opportunity. Hopefully you all walked away with really a, a sense of the future. We at Bramasol believe that the S4 HANA future is all about a focus on fit to standard, using standardized processes to leverage those into a finance first approach. Um, we see a lot more organizations thinking about finance first approach and standardized tools, whether it's using something like central finance to quickly enable time to value and allow you to kind of put your toe in the water or leveraging things like model SAP model company and the Bramasol Ignite uh, methodology to allow you to, to leverage that. So I wanna take, again, thank all of you for joining us. Uh, look for some of our uh, demos and small presentations that you can get through our website. And thanks everybody and have a terrific rest of the day. Bye-bye.